Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar is called Cruelty to Others. We're very lucky to have Dr. Lionel Corbett back with us today. Speaking today will be myself as just a host and technician, but Lionel Corbett will be the presenter. We have a lot of participating countries again. We have Australia, Canada, Estonia, Hong Kong, Japan, Lithuania, Norway, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and of course the United States. Today is a webinar and it's 90 minutes long. You're able to ask questions from any computer. You can go ahead and send those to me via email or you can use the chat feature. Make sure you're on the right audio setting. Most folks will use the mic and speaker. That's where you listen through your computer itself. But if you need to, please do use the telephone setting. Explore the features. There's a full screen mode and you're also able to enlarge the presenter. Um, so please do so. And of course, there's the question feature. You can use that or the chat. Our next event is the Entangled State of God and Humanity, and that's with Peter Todd. Uh, that will be a great event. He's out of Australia, and he's going to talk about his union aspects on spirituality. And of course, that is next month on the 12th. I need to let everybody know we have no commercial support of any kind for presenters, topics, or programs. No, pharmace no pharmaceutical industry support of any kind associated with us today. There will be an online survey, so please do fill that out when you have a moment. Recording warning, we are taping today, so when you ask your question, if you want to remain anonymous, please just let us know in your email. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Lionel Corbett. He trained in medicine and psychiatry in England as a union analyst. Right now, he's currently a core faculty member at the Pacifica Graduate Institute in California. He's author of The Sacred Cauldron, as well as many other books, and this is his second webinar with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to enter, let uh, Dr. Corbett take us away. Just one second, let me get everything set up here. <clears throat> can you hear me, Dr. Corbett? Yes, I can hear you, Ryan. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let you take us away then. Okay, thank you, Ryan, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the problem of deliberate gratuitous cruelty to other people this evening um, because this causes enormous suffering and it's constantly in the news. We constantly hear about it in the form of torture and imprisonment and bombings and similar behavior. And of course there are other interpersonal acts of cruelty like belittling other people, teasing, bullying, racial prejudice, betrayal and that kind of behavior. We even see cruelty as well as empathy in the play of children. There's something very fundamental about it. And uh, even God has been accused of being cruel. For example, in the biblical book of Job, who complains that God makes him suffer even though he's innocent. Now, in Western thought, there have been many interpretations and, and definitions of cruelty. And it's important to note that the meaning of cruelty, the definition where we think about cruelty, has varied a great deal historically in different geographical regions, different historical periods. For example, there was a time when beating one's children was once considered to be necessary rather than cruel. And slavery has not always been recognized as cruel historically, of course. So, um, but from a modern point of view to us, the word cruelty implies intentionally inflicting pain or fear on another person and sometimes deriving sadistic pleasure from doing so with the connotation that the perpetrator could restrain himself if he wished to. And even if the cruel person doesn't take pleasure in his actions, for example, when uh, cruelty is inflicted as a form of social control or punishment, which it often is, the perpetrator may show no mercy or pity for his victims. And we have the intuition that there's something wrong with the person who constantly behaves cruelly to another person only for the sake of self-gratification. We have a very strong moral intuition that makes this behavior abhorrent. So what is the source of this behavior? Well, of course, there are a variety of explanations. One suggestion is that cruelty is a uniquely human trait, not found in animals, and that it's the byproduct of evolutionary, uh, uh, an evolutionary byproduct of predatory behavior, which is very widespread. The theory is there that our early hominid ancestors uh, needed easily digestible, nutritious food 
to develop increased brain size. And this lead, led to the need to hunt. The suggestion here is that the evolutionary precursor of predatory behavior is competitive aggression. And there is some neurobiological research which suggests that hunting and killing are positive emotional experiences for the predators. The sight of pain and blood and death are said to be linked to brain dopaminergic and opioid systems which are affectively rewarding and positive. Same systems that are partly linked to sexual arousal. So the idea is that as a result of this evolutionary development of the need to hunt, punitive and disciplinary cruelty emerged as a kind of byproduct in human societies, byproduct of the need to hunt. And this, uh, if this idea is correct, then we're wired to be cruel to other people because of our evolutionary history. And that may explain why cruelty can be perpetrated by people who haven't been socialized to be cruel. And it helps us to understand why we're attracted to cruelty in the media, in, in movies, and so on. Now, if this evolutionary theory uh, is correct, that doesn't, of course, mean we shouldn't condemn cruelty. And it doesn't absolve perpetrators and their audiences from moral responsibility. This theory of the evolutionary source of cruelty has been criticized on various grounds. It looks like it's a bit too restrictive to attribute all forms of cruelty to predatory behavior. There probably are other factors involved. There might be competition for resources, interest, species aggression, and so on. In any case, one would think that our advanced psychological development would modify our evolutionary inheritance as we start to develop social uh, significance. There are parallels to human cruelty among animals. Um, for example, the territorial aggression of chimpanzees produces violence towards other chimpanzees. And a cat will toy with a mouse until the mouse dies. But the problem is we don't know if these animals are intending to cause suffering to others in a sort of self-conscious way. We don't know if these behaviors are simply forms of aggression. So we have to define cruelty as the deliberate infliction of physical or psychological pain on other creatures, sometimes with delight, unfortunately. Um, cruelty requires then the intention to inflict pain and also the, um, the infliction of pain because doing so causes the victim to suffer. Um, Cruelty, of course, has no regard for another person. And the antidotes to cruelty are concern, empathy, and compassion. In most normal people, to see the suffering of another person restrains cruel behavior, um, which, for example, might mean that not seeing the suffering produced by drone strikes makes them more likely to be used. So a great deal of cruelty is the result of lack of empathy for other people. And lack of empathy is associated with indifference to others. And it would seem that empathy, the ability to sense the emotional state of another person, would reduce cruel behavior. But this isn't entirely true. There are some sadistic people who use their empathic ability to enjoy their victim's pain. And the sadist motive also includes the enjoyable exercise of power. There are sadists, of course, especially the psychopathic variety, who have no capacity for empathy, and they're not restrained by shame or guilt or anything like that. Um, some of this radical failure of empathy required for psychopathic cruelty is based primar primarily in some abnormality of the individual's brain, and some of it is secondary to developmental factors. That normal human beings have an inborn predisposition to resonate with the experience of other people. And that suggests an evolutionary basis for empathy as well as for cruelty, because empathy must have had some survival value for the species. So that many researchers think that empathy is based on a primitive biological core in the brain. But other people point out that this innate or archetypal capacity for empathy also has a developmental line that can go awry in childhood. So just as we've evolved to be predators, fortunately we've also evolved the capacity to be cooperative, empathic, and mutually caring. And many people suggest that 
reasonable psychological health requires a balance between aggression and dominance and pro-social or, or caring behavior to other people. So the evolutionary aspect is one important aspect. There's also, of course, the important psychological aspect of cruelty. There's a very ancient idea going all the way back to Aristotle that people are cruel in order to exact revenge for the way they were treated in childhood. There are parents who abuse their children apparently in response to the abuse that these parents suffered in their own childhood or they stabilize their narcissistic disequilibrium by hitting their children. Um, so then in that case, that's the view of uh, modern psychologists like Alice Miller. Cruelty to others is revenge for the cruelty that one experienced in childhood. So then cruelty is a pathological product of accumulated rage and an unconscious form of revenge on the people who hurt us. Children who ruthlessly tease other children are often unconsciously identifying with adults who abuse them in a kind of role reversal or turning passive into active. As we know, sometimes a child abuser will unconsciously identify with people who abused him, um, while the child he's abusing will unconsciously represent a split off infantile level of himself. Not surprisingly, most aggressive criminals suffered severe childhood abuse themselves. In an attempt to master the situation, some victims of child abuse unconsciously repeat the experience of being a victim of cruelty in a repetition compulsion. Although some people who are abused in childhood go into helping professions, I think the difference is that the ones who become helpers uh, are able to identify with at least one decent person who was kind to them at the time of the abuse. And it's very important to bear in mind here the standard warning that understanding evil or cruel behavior is not to condone it. Understanding and empathy and explanation may increase the likelihood of forgiveness for cruel behavior, but they may not necessarily do so. So why is it that some of us develop concern for other people while other people are able to commit appalling acts of cruelty? Well, I've mentioned some evolutionary and some psychological factors. There are also societal and political factors at work in the transformation of ordinary people into perpetrators of extreme cruelty. Clinical psychologists, of course, tend to look for psychological explanations, but there are social psychological explanations as well. Uh, and the social psychologists would say it's not true that only psychologically abnormal people commit cruel crimes. There are societies or rulers who are cruel to maintain power and social dominance for no other reason. We know that ordinary people can commit genocide and mass killings. We saw that in Rwanda and in Nazi Germany. Genocide requires an ideology, ethnic prejudice, organization, training, leadership, and so on. There are people who are able to resist these collective pressures, but very often one of the problems with being part of a, of a, a large group is that individual judgment is submerged into a kind of mass psychology, especially when this is combined with devotion to a charismatic leader like Hitler. People will then lose their personal identity, they regress, they are swept away by the emotion and by the behavior of the crowd, and they behave in a way that they wouldn't do as an individual. Being a member of a large crowd seems to produce a state of what you could call de-individuation, in which the person is less likely to act according to his or her normal values. Apparently, the sense of being part of a huge group produces a feeling of strength and security. And it's important to remember also that the, what psychologists have called the bystander effect. This is the fact that um, if somebody's in trouble on the street and need help, the research shows that the more onlookers are present, the less probable it is that the person in need will be helped. As if personal responsibility is reduced when there's a large crowd present. So there are situational and social factors that mo mo motivate cruelty and genocide. You have to devalue an ethnic or a political group, especially uh, it helps if you have a despotic leader. 
you have to have a destructive ideology which is simplistic, uh, which has a very simplistic view of history. You have to have rather uncritical respect for authority. Uh, you have to have lack of shared goals with the people that you're persecuting. And you have to have passive bystanders. And then the uh, perpetrators believe that they're supported by the, by the culture that they, they live in. And even if the bystanders are not indifferent to people who are being persecuted, they may feel powerless in the presence of a dictatorship with armed soldiers. And then, of course, one has to add the effects of idealizing a dangerous leader like Hitler, the power of group identity, thoughtless nationalism, which is a huge problem, the distortion of historical truth, and religious prejudices, all of which can be manipulated by authoritarian leaders. It is actually quite difficult for ordinary people to kill or torture another human being. So uh, um, totalitarian leaders will use dehumanizing propaganda and that will treat the persecuted group as if they were less than human. So during the Rwandan genocide, the Hutus referred to the Tutsis as cockroaches. And during the Nazi Holocaust, the Nazis referred to the Jews as rats. And then people start to believe they have a moral duty to exterminate the persecuted group. This is all the product of, of uh, propaganda, of course. Um, there is um, an important counter-argument, though, to this emphasis on the pressure of social factors. Uh, Goldhagen, in his discussion of the Nazi genocide, pointed out that many of the perpetrators were fully responsible for their actions. They knew what they were doing, they carried it out intentionally, and they were not coerced. Many of these people have an unconscious belief in what's called a just world, the idea that everything happens for a reason. So then when they see people being victimized, somehow they start to feel that the victims must deserve their suffering somehow because of who they are. Now, as we know, uh, from an intrapsychic standpoint, one can see racial and ethnic prejudice as a, as a function of unconscious splitting and um, unconscious primitive splitting and projection. This is a mental mechanism which reduces uncertainty, it reduces ambiguity, and it simplifies existence so that we are all good and they're all bad. And extreme religious and political ideologies always project the group's disowned negative qualities onto the persecuted group. That becomes a scapegoat. Um, just as a, an individual, uh, the group can try to destroy their own badness by destroying it in another person. One of the problems that arises here is that sometimes um, people who are behaving cruelly uh, in a persecutory way to others will start to feel guilt um, and internal discomfort. And so because they're made to feel guilty by their own behavior, they, they, the, the persecutor will, will hate the persecuted even more rather than feeling remorse as a defense against feeling remorse. And if you do uh, have social and ethnic prejudice, you can maintain a kind of narcissistic sense of superiority over the persecuted group. Uh, and you can and regard members of other ethnicities as inferior. And then you can evacuate any of your own feelings of inadequacy or low self-esteem by projecting them onto the devalued group. You don't need then any self-reflection or self-criticism. And you can bolster your own self-esteem by making cruel jokes about the devalued group or laughing at the misfortunes of the devalued group and so on. There are a large number now of classical experiments which uh, show how uh, an individual can lose his or her autonomous thinking under the right conditions. I'll tell you just some of these uh, research experiments. There's an experiment by Dolly and Batson in the 70s um, that was based on the biblical story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, verse 29. In that story, a priest and a Levite ignore an injured man on the side of the road, but a passing Samaritan that was a member of a devalued group at the time helps the victim. It's not clear in the story why the first two people ignored the man who needed help. Um, it's, the implication is they didn't really follow the values that they were preaching. Anyway, these researchers recruited a, a group of seminary students 
a, in a Christian seminary to study this question. Um, they took the students into one office uh, and in that office they filled out questionnaires and then they were told to go to another office on the campus. And some of them were told that they would have to give a talk about a job for people who graduated from seminary. Others were told to prepare a, a, a sermon about the Good Samaritan story. Uh, and on the way, they encountered an actor who was acting as if he obviously needed a great deal of help. And the experiment was to see what would happen if you vary the degree of urgency in the students. Some of them were told that they were in a great hurry. They were late for the next task. And some of the subjects in that group didn't even notice the man who was in need. They actually stepped over him. Some of the students offered small degrees of help, and some offered a good deal of help. The result of the experiment was that the more you're in a hurry, the more urgent that you feel your task is, um, the less likely you are to stop and offer aid. Uh, and the questionnaires showed that the type of thinking that preoccupied the students had very little effect on their behavior. And there was no correlation between religious students and helping behavior. Another important uh, experiment was the Stanford Prison Experiment done by Philip Zimbardo in uh, 1996. This was a study of social roles which demonstrated the effect of either being a prisoner or a prison guard in this simulated experiment. He um, randomly selected students to take either uh, the role of being a prisoner or a prison guard in the mock prison. And the problem was that the participants really adapted to their roles rather too well. The guards became abusive and tried to degrade the prisoners. The prisoners became passive and docile, and they harassed other prisoners who attempted to prevent uh, any abuse. And things got so out of hand that they had to stop the experiment after only six days. This is the kind of experiment which produces a model which helps us understand the cruelty displayed by soldiers at Abu Ghraib, who were unable to resist this kind of behavior. And it's very important to note that Zimbardo was unable to predict from psychological tests ahead of time which guards would become brutal and which would not. Um, the Yale psychologist Stanley Milgram studied obedience to authority. He was trying to, he was interested in the question of whether Eichmann and the other Nazis were just following orders in a way that allowed them to override their conscience, or whether they were real conscious accomplices in the Holocaust. So they took uh, groups of students, they paired them um, into uh, learners um, and teachers. The learner, of course, was um, uh, one of Milgram's collaborators. He, the learner was strapped to a chair with electrodes attached to him. And um, the student was told that this was an experiment to see whether uh, pain would increase the subject's ability to learn word pairs. So the um, they would name a word and ask the learner to recall a partner word in a sort of word association test. And there was an authority figure in a white coat who told the, the student to deliver electric shocks of increasing intensity to the learner each time he made a mistake. And the learner, who was an actor, but the student of course didn't know he was an actor, would occasionally give deliberately incorrect answers. And if the teacher tried to refused to administer shocks, the experimenter would insist that the teacher keeps doing so, in spite of the apparent pain that he seemed to be inflicting. Well, it turned out that two-thirds of the participants obeyed the authority figure, and they would continue to administer shocks to the maximum level, producing what looked like severe pain on the learner. So this study showed that for some people, the approval and the insistence of an authority figure allows some ordinary people to perform very cruel acts. So Milgram concluded from that experiment that human nature alone is not sufficient to protect, to protect us from being cruel to other people if we are ordered to do so at the behest of an authority figure. This might include uh, figures like a malevolent government official or a gang leader, and then one thinks of cult figures like Jim Jones, who ordered his followers to commit mass suicide. So all, overall, these experiments and the evidence of history suggest that the readiness to be cruel 
is universally human given the right situation. It seems to be an archetypal predisposition that can be evoked by the right situation. But at the same time, fortunately, we've also evolved an instinct for compassion, which um, might be the result of genetically based bonds of kinship. Um, so this combination of potentials, of archetypal potentials, might cause us to oscillate between fascination and horror when we witness cruelty to others in the media. Now, others here would include animals, of course, and there's a good deal of interest and, and concern now with the interaction of human beings and animals. Um, Cruelty has been defined as uh, cruelty to animals has been defined as socially unacceptable behavior that intentionally causes unnecessary pain, suffering, or distress to an animal. This is important to psychotherapists, by the way, for several reasons. First of all, of course, we have a moral obligation to treat animals properly. Cruelty to animals causes unnecessary suffering. And we now realize there's an important association between cruelty to animals in childhood and adult personality disorder and antisocial behavior and interpersonal violence in adulthood. If one gets used to committing cruelty to animals, this seems to inhibit the child's capacity for empathy and makes, it makes the person e more able to disregard the feelings of other people as well as the feelings of animals. It turns out from the research that abused children abuse animals, perhaps acting out what happened to them, perhaps in an identification with the abuser or to gain some semblance of control. Children seems to, seem to learn to abuse animals if they witness animal abuse in their families or if they grow up in violent families. Um, early experience with violence in families predisposes to the, to the use of violence in adulthood. But it's also true that some children who grow up in abusive homes become activists on behalf of animals. By the way, husbands who batter their wives often will also abuse animals in the home as a way of further intimidating everybody in the family. Feminists, of course, have seen male violence against animals as a symptom of patriarchal male dominance. So there are several psychological factors involved in cruelty to animals, lack of empathy, a poor anger control, impulsivity, high levels of interpersonal aggression, all these predisposed. Um, and animal abuse is becoming an important field of study because, partly because it's related to human violence. This of course, uh, cruelty to animals has, has a very long history. One only has to think of the ancient Roman practices in which large numbers of animals were killed in amphitheaters built for the purpose. And apparently these spectators were able to identify with the excitement of a gladiator killing the animal. And that must have produced a vicarious sense of pleasure, suggesting that some of the neurobiologists who've written about this might be correct. And the same process of identification may account for our uh, some cultures, contemporary enjoyment of competitive fighting and bullfighting, for example. Bullfights seem to arouse the spectators emotionally. Hemingway, in his Death in the Afternoon, wrote that if the matador is unsuccessful, the spectators may swarm into the arena and kill the bull themselves. In today's culture, unfortunately, there are anti-cruelty laws which at least affirm that cruelty is wrong, but they're not very effective. Um, because uh, animals are considered to be property and they have no legal standing. And there's a great deal of legal cruelty to animals in the form of factory farming and animal ex experimentation, testing of cosmetics, the use of animals in surfaces and zoos and so on. And it's not clear to me why our society tolerates these practices. Presumably the reasons are largely economic. But partly I think it's because traditional religions see animal, see humans as superior to animals. And that doesn't promote a humane attitude. And this may partially account for our cultural indifference to the cruelty inflicted on animals in animal slaughter facilities and in medical research. 
Human beings have always been hunters of animals, and early hunter-gatherer societies uh, are thought to have, have observed rituals which reduced their guilt about the need to kill. They had to kill to eat, but they were guilty about it. And some modern hunters also feel guilt or grief at the death of an animal at the same time as they feel gratification at killing animals. Again, there's that mixture of feelings. But at the time when they're hunting, of course, any compassion or guilt has to be split off. Uh, often when they're actually hunting, the, the hunter has a kind of empty emotional state and then a feeling of pleasure after the kill. Um, and many hunters admire or are fascinated by the survival skills and the beauty of wild animals. And many hunters attach great importance to the knowledge of the natural world that they have and the way they interact with it. Um, so the hunting on one side, cruelty on the other side, but there's also a human capacity for empathic identification with animals. And this seems to be why many uh, people are uh, have a great deal of interest in, in the welfare of animals, they will see hunting as barbaric. In Britain, there's been a great deal of debate about the ban on fox hunting. Um, briefly, those in favor of the ban said that hunting was cruel and morally wrong, and those who defended hunting argued that it was a relatively humane way of controlling the number of foxes who were a danger to livestock. Uh, many people think that's a rather thin excuse. And of course, there's always the evolutionary argument. Human beings evolved to be where to beware of becoming the prey of predatory animals, and that predatory predator anxiety partly accounts for our fear of strangers and people who are very different than ourselves. And it may account for stranger anxiety in infancy as well. <clears throat> so apparently, one way to cope with predator anxiety is by becoming a predator oneself. Hunting, of course, has other possible explanations. It may be enjoyable because it allows mastery. It may not necessarily be the result of cruelty or the result of the wish to inflict suffering. But torture certainly is about the wish to inflict suffering. So I'd like to say something about that. Torture, I understand here to be any action which inflicts deliberate, unbearable, unjustified, and unnecessary physical or mental suffering on a person or on any other sentient being. This type of cruelty is often used as a form of punishment and political control, for example, in Saddam Hussein's Iraq and many other similar cultures. Or it's used to, as a form of punishment, political control, to punish offenders, to intimidate citizens, or to express the power of the state. But whatever the reason, torture always violates human dignity, and most of us see, see it as deeply morally wrong, suggesting that it offends an inborn moral code. There is some debate about whether morality is inborn or learned. For many of us, uh, torture will offend our in, innate sense of morality, what Jung might uh, speak of as the moral function of the self. Even in liberal democracies, uh, the practice of torture has been justified to prevent imminent and serious threats to the population. And what these liberal democracies do is narrow the definition of torture to try to sanitize it or to domesticate it, especially to domesticate forms of torture that don't cause obvious physical damage. Like They use forms like sleep deprivation or solitary confinement or degrading treatment or exposure to extreme cold. But all these forms of torture produce long-term physical and psychological damage. They all produce PTSD, they all produce depression, anxiety, impaired memory, insomnia, nightmares, and other very serious emotional and physical sequelae. Their torture is never benign or free of side effects. And the torture victim's imagination adds to his pain. He constantly imagines the dreadful things which might happen next. He worries about the fate of his family uh, and so on. And there are enduring personality changes which have been reported among victims of torture. There are many uh, accounts of survival of torture which describe what happened to them. 
and how difficult it is to live in a world in which torture is a reality. The survivor's family is often affected and the consequences of torture can be transmitted across generations to children and grandchildren. And there are professional groups like the American Psychiatric Association which prohibit their members from participating in, tor in torture. Um, but we also know, for example, from Lifton's interviews with Nazi doctors that some physicians may abandon their personal and professional values in societies where torture is the norm. Now, since torture is repugnant to most of us, um, of interest to the psychologist is the question of how a torturer is able to inflict pain on another human being. Um, even if the interrogator believes the torture is justified, for example, to save lives during the what's called the ticking bomb scenario. This is a, uh, an imaginary scenario where one is torturing somebody who knows where a bomb is about to go off. Um, of course, uh, some of the people who, who torture others have written personal, personal testimony and they've said that they initially, initially do feel distress of what they're doing, but eventually if they do it enough, they habituate and they start to feel nothing. They become inured to it. But at times, um, the, the pain and the fear of the victim actually escalates the savagery of the torturer. Um, and this phenomenon has also been said to have evolutionary roots, parallel, paralleling the escalating ferocity of a predator as the terror and the death struggle of the prey increase. Now, I don't know whether interviews with torturers provide reliable information about why they torture. I know that, according to their accounts, they use a variety of strategies to harden themselves against their behavior and to block off any empathy, empathy or sympathy for the victims. For example, they dehumanize the victim, they blame the victim, or they appeal to reasons like national security. Um, they focus on their attention on the process of questioning. They try to ignore the, the pain of the victim uh, in an attempt to sort of neutralize the moral fact that they're inflicting agony on another person. They will rationalize their actions. They use euphemisms like uh, interrogation, gathering intelligence, and so on. Or sometimes they, they deflect responsibility onto their superiors. There are, of course, some torturers who are latent sadists who are given an opportunity to simply de-repress this behavior. Um, and then in that case, the torture will um, express the sadist's need to dominate other people and to have absolute power over other people. Sadism, of course, was traditionally considered to be a sexual perversion, the experience of erotic pleasure associated with cruelty. But in fact, sadism is broader than that. Sadism means any form in which a person enjoys hurting others. I haven't found any good, single, convincing psychological explanation for this behavior. It's quite difficult to understand it. There's the traditional psychoanalytic view of sadism, which is erotized aggression or a function of the death instinct. I don't find those um, very helpful views. Um, another view is that the sadist is trying to overcome feelings of being unlovable and impotent by expressing, by demonstrating his power. Um, it may be that the sadistic torturer is trying to master his own terror, his own childhood experience when he was tortured as a child, when he was passive and helpless by becoming omnipotent, by making someone else suffer the torments that he was made to feel as a child. So he's evacuating his own terror onto somebody else, making somebody else suffer. Then all the torturer's personal weakness and vulnerability, his unconscious sense of being a traumatized child, is projected onto the helpless victim. And somehow this ensures that the torturer himself will survive. Um, that's another possibility is that torturing other people is a variant of the intense need for revenge which characterizes chronic narcissistic rage in an attempt to right the wrong done to oneself in childhood. In which case the person, uh, the, the, the person who's doing the torturing is unconsciously identified with parents who tortured him. But it's very important 
uh, in all these cases to note that torture is not only harmful to the victim, torture is very harmful to the one who tortures because it has a depraving effect on the person who commits torture. Torturers sometimes suffer long-term emotional damage to themselves, even when they were given situational justification for their actions. And the use of torture, of course, harms the character of the society that condones the practices. It erodes its standards of behavior. Um, now, it's true that corrupt societies are more likely to use, uh, and totalitarian leaders are more likely to use torture in the first place because torture is used to impose the power of the state. And it's true that for the most part, liberal democracies only torture when they feel under threat. However, the use of torture is actually very difficult co to control. You might say that we're only going to use it in limited cases, but the problem is once you start to use it, the use of torture tends to spread to more and more suspects because people no longer know where to draw the line and the use of torture can get out of hand and prisoners can be tortured even when the torturers themselves don't believe they have any useful information. And nowadays many experienced interrogators have said that non-coercive interrogation gets better results than torture. And in any, in any case torture may not extract reliable information. So I think that in many cases torture is really nothing more than a disguised form of sadism which we find instinctively revolting. It would take a person of extraordinary moral character to know when torture is truly necessary to save a life, as in the ticking bomb scenario. And then, if torture was necessary, it would have to be proportionate and not inflicted intentionally on an innocent person. Um, and there are people who hold that position as part of what they, what's known as the just war tradition. The just war tradition is, is held by certain religious traditions which hold that killing in war is morally permissible under certain circumstances. Uh, for example, if there's good reason and the right motivation and the war is proportional and it's a last resort and so on. For so much for torture to other people, but it occurred to me as I was uh, working on this that there's a great deal of um, torture to oneself which goes on. So I'd like to say a little bit um, about the problem of um, self-abuse. Um, there are many world mythologies which teach that pain and suffering and mortification of the body can be actively pursued in the service of human spirituality, for instance. The obvious examples are the austerities of Hindu mystics, the stigmata, experienced by Christian saints and mystics um, whose hands and feet will spontaneously bleed in a way that mimics the wounds of Christ on the cross. Throughout the ages, the Christian mystics have scourged themselves and whipped and tortured themselves in many ways, apparently because they believe that the soul or their spirituality benefits from self-induced suffering. Perhaps they feel it purifies the soul in some way or it leads to self-transcendence. Other traditions do likewise. The Muslims will walk for weeks on a pilgrimage to Mecca uh, to the point that their feet are bleeding. In the Native American sun dance, the dancer will suspend himself from a pole with a pin that pierces through the skin of the chest and so on. Um, so th this is common in all the religious traditions. A good example is the 16th century nun, Saint Maria Madalena de Pazzi. She would walk barefoot in the winter, she would drip hot candle wax on her body, she wore a nail studded corset and a crown of thorns. She also had stigmata and uh, she said that she was subject to attacks by evil spirits who would throw her down the stairs and beat her. So this kind of behavior, for religious reasons, has been called sacred pain. Um, and that's a term that's used to describe the ways in which the devout of many religious traditions will torture themselves and glorify pain and suffering, apparently for the sake of spiritual development or in the name of the divine and so on. Um, and um, they try to uh, transform this kind of behavior into something positive. Uh, the suffering becomes a mechanism by which the, the sufferer becomes part of a reality 
that transcends his or her individual life. So the wounds become a form of communion with the sacred. Um, the religious practice, practitioner has a change in his identity, apparently, as a result of the torture, the self-torture. He feels, uh, or she feels, an enhanced sense of connection to the divine. And also they find that um, this kind of self-torture will suppress bodily desires, such as sexuality and hunger. And the question that's of interest to the psychologist here is, is this self-induced pain for religious reasons pathological or not? Certainly the classical psychoanalyst would say so. They would see this kind of self-induced suffering as masochism. Masochism classically in psychoanalysis was seen to be the result of unconscious guilt that required punishment. Or there is a form of self-punishment which is intended to alleviate the fear of being hurt by others. If I hurt myself, then perhaps you won't hurt me. There are now uh, psychoanalytic self-psychologists who see self-induced pain or masochism as enlivening uh, an, an attempt to um, enliven or transform a dead or a defective sense of self. Um, but the, uh, people who say that this, is, this has uh, really spiritual roots will simply say that self-inflicted pain by religious practitioners is used to reduce the hegemony of the ego and to allow an experience of transcendent reality to erupt into consciousness. So at the moment this debate is a matter of opinion. But um, since we occasionally do work with committed Christians, it's worth pointing out that penance has always been an important Christian practice. Uh, in an earlier year, era, of course, this involved self-inflicted pain like self-flagellation. So it's not a coincidence that the roots of the word penance and penal and punishment are etymologically connected to the Latin poena. In the history of Christianity, self-induced punishment um, was uh, thought to be a cure for sin. It was a kind of medicine that um, ensured salvation or spiritual health. Um, so the pain itself wasn't the goal, which is the argument against this being purely masochistic. It was thought to be a medicine for the soul. Today, many psychologists, however, will see masochistic behavior as largely separate from religion, and they will see it as pathological. Now, I'd like to say a little bit more about stigmata uh, while we're on this subject. These are spontaneous wounds which appear on the body that resemble the wounds on the crucified body of Christ. Bleeding appears on the palms, the feet, the chest, sometimes tears of blood and sometimes around the head where Christ wore a crown of thorns. Sometimes this is accompanied by an ecstatic state and sometimes the wounds appear on a regular schedule such as Friday or Friday to Sunday and so on. And again there are a great many interpretations of this phenomenon the devout see these stigmata as supernaturally produced. The cynical or skeptical see them as hysterical or dissociative or fraudulent, um, consciously or unconsciously produced by the individual by self-mutilation during an ecstatic or dissociative state. The dermatologists call this dermatitis artifacta. Um, there are people who said that if the subject is powerfully identified with Christ, then psychosomatic bodily changes can occur um, and bleeding into the skin, so-called psychogenic purpura, has been reported to be a psychogenic condition. Of course, naming is not explaining and none of these psychological explanations disprove the subject's personal belief that uh, the wounds are divinely given signs of a connection to God. And stigmatics themselves often report that their suffering is an act of love or agape for all humanity. And that connects the phenomena with traditional Christian theology of Christ's suffering and so on. Historically, um, the earliest known stigmata were those of St. Francis of Assisi in the 13th century. And interestingly, they were initially mistrusted by the church because it seemed as if he was trying to infringe on the unique status of Jesus. Um, it's interesting that uh, if we look at the biography of Francis, at the time they occurred, he was physically very ill. He was nearly blind. 
and he was in considerable emotional distress because of the political turmoil that had, re had resulted from the establishment of his new order of monks. What happened was that he had a vision in which a six-winged seraph embraced a crucified man. And then the crucified man seemed somehow to pierce Francis's own body. And then the stigmata appeared. Since St. Francis, hundreds of stig stigmatics have appeared. And the phenomena became very well known in the medieval era among devout Christians. St. Teresa of Avila, interestingly, was said to have invisible stigmata, which took the form of a wound to her heart which she said she received in a vision from an angel who thrust a golden dart with a fiery tip into her heart. But the phenomena continues. A recent case is the case of Audrey Santo, who um, was a young, severely disabled girl. Who, she was born in 1983 in Worcester, Massachusetts. She lived uh, until 2007. And what happened to her was that she almost drowned having fallen into the family swimming pool at the age of three. She went into a coma um, because of brain damage. And so it was never clear how conscious she was of her surroundings, but she developed stigmata that were witnessed by many people. And she was thought to be responsible for miraculous healings. She was regarded as what was called a victim soul, somebody who offers her own suffering for the sake of others. And there are many other contemporary examples. But the Roman Catholic Church still has a somewhat ambivalent attitude to the authenticity of stigmata. And they're not terribly comfortable with the popular interest in stigmatics because of the suspicion that these lesions are either hysterical or self-induced. But certainly for medieval stigmatics, pain and bleeding um, were not intended to be destructive or a punishment their identification with Christ at the moment of his dying. They were aware, uh, they were a way of sharing the pain of Christ. And during the Middle Ages, the blood from Christ's wounds was regarded as analogous to milk from a mother's breast. So, mother, so women who experienced the stigmata replicated Jesus's maternal role by allowing Christ's blood to, fl to um, flow through them to nurture other people. So the stigmatic's blood would purge her own soul and save her fellow Christians by atoning for their sins. And uh, in that tradition, the sound of the flagellants whipping was said to rise to God's ears as a sweet melody. Of course, um, the skeptics will point out that the um, many stigmatics in medieval times were also anorexic, so-called holy anorexia. And they at nothing except the Eucharistic host. And fasting is of course used in many cultures to achieve altered states of consciousness or spiritual transcendence. Um, and the skeptics have pointed out that in view of the misogynistic and dehumanizing treatment of women by the church during the Middle Ages, asceticism like this among women religious was a way of exerting some semblance of personal control when they had no other forms of power or authority. The psychoanalysts, of course, um, all considered stigmata to be hysterical and to be the result of auto-suggestion. Um, the stigmata have been seen to be a post-traumatic stress symptom in the presence of an abnormal degree of auto-suggestibility. One of the uh, um, current psychoanalytic case studies, uh, studies from 2002 by Albright uh, is a study of Therese Neumann, a young Bavarian stigmatic who um, became an invalid and was in constant pain and fear of death for several years. And one day she heard a voice which asked her if she would like to get well. And the voice told her that if she wished she'd be able to walk and then her mobility improved and she had a vision of Christ followed by stigmata on her hands and feet and tears of blood appeared. The cause of all this was never established um, and um, uh, her own belief was that um, the wounds came from God and nobody has, able, uh, has been able to establish any kind of psychological roots for her stigmata. So this is still 
uh, an unanswered question and an open debate. Now what about self-mutilation like cutting and so on? Um, well, um, um, religious ascetics and self-mutilators all seem to be making a sacrifice in the service of a higher goal. Self-mutilators deliberately and compulsively cut, burn themselves, uh, bang their heads, pull their hair out, scratch their skin with no suicidal intent. This has been called bodies under siege. And many self-mutilators are also anorexic. They torture themselves by not eating as well. Um, the pain produced does not seem to be important among self-mutilators, which is an interesting similarity to religiously motivated self-induced suffering. Both of these two groups of people are using the pain for some other reason to achieve some kind of healing, apparently. Now, of course, there's no agreed upon explanation for self-inflicted suffering. It's often associated with an eating disorder, and it's often associated with sexual or physical abuse at an early age. Sometimes there is temporary euphoria during the episode, um, and uh, it's been reported that these uh, individuals will secrete endogenous opiates, beta endorphins, and so on. And that might be a partial explanation for why they don't experience pain. Um, the self-mutilators themselves will give a variety of explanations. Some of them will describe emptiness or deadness, which is so unpleasant, or depersonalization, which is so unpleasant that the pain relieves it. The pain seems to release tension. It seems to act as a form of self-soothing. And in fact, self-cutting is often triggered either by a rejection interpersonally or by some experience of being devalued. Um, psychoanalysts, of course, see self-mutilation as a variety of masochism or self-punishment for an unconscious sense of badness. Um, other people have said self-mutilation is an attempt to establish a degree of narcissistic equilibrium and self-cohesion by exerting a, a degree of control over one's emotions. And other people have said it's a, the self-cutting is a way of attacking an internal bad object, such as the internalized bad mother. Self-mutilation has been seen by the Freudians as a form of disguised sexual gratification, which at the same time punishes the person for the act. Um, it has been seen uh, by the self-psychologists as an attempt to counteract the experience of self-annihilation as an attempt to restore and maintain the cohesion and the stability of a precarious or fragmenting sense of self. Um, some people have suggested that the self-cutter is trying to carve out a new sense of herself out of her own flesh, as if she's trying to reach some other image of herself that is trapped inside her flesh. Other theorists have suggested that self-mutilators are trying to fend off the self that they're losing their boundaries, and the sight of blood on the skin acts as a kind of concrete marker of an outer boundary. Um, and some people have said it's um, simply a way of knowing that one is alive. Uh, one or two Jungians have suggested that self-mutilation is similar to the tribal initiation rituals in the women's rites of passage. And this has led to the suggestion that self-mutilation is actually an attempt at self-initiation. Well, that's all I, I have to say um, about this subject. Um, so uh, perhaps we could spend the next uh, bit of time that we have left discussing any of this or questions, comments, please. Oh, can you hear me, Dr. Can't hear you. I'm sorry, is your microphone muted? Let's see, can you hear me now? I got you, yeah, that was fine, yes. Wonderful. That was fascinating, Dr. Corbett. Um, okay, well, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, please, uh, if you have some, send them in through the chat. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think of something that I was thinking about during this. Um, you mentioned narcissistic parents. Uh, I follow a blog that... Um, children or adults who have narcissistic parents go on and 
kind of reach out for help. Um, and I saw one recently where a father was suing his son because the son had cut him off. Um, and the son was asking if the father ever loved him in general, um, dealing with a narcissistic parent who has never really shown any approval or um, mm -hmm. any love. Uh, do you have anything to uh, comment on that about, on whether or not narcissistic parents actually have feelings for their children or if they're just kind of pawns well, in their own the, game? It depends on the degree, of obviously, but um, there are parents who, um, who will use their children uh, to bolster their own self-esteem. This is sometimes called the reverse self-object experience, where the parent sort of gets off on the child's beauty or intelligence or academic prowess or whatever. But then the, the, the child is used in the service of maintaining the parent's narcissistic equilibrium. That's a very typical scenario. Um, I was talking about um, parents who, who uh, there are people who will beat their children to try to stabilize their own narcissistic equilibrium when, when they feel like they're falling apart. The Hitler had that experience. Hitler was beaten every day by his a very brutal alcoholic father um, growing up till I think he died when Hitler was about 12 or 13, I've forgotten. But that kind of parent, of course, will produce enormous levels of rage and hatred uh, in the child, which then have to be, they can't be contained, they're too intense, have to be evacuated onto somebody else, um, I see. which isn't too which isn't to condone his behavior, of course, but it's just one aspect of uh, trying to understand it. Right, I, re I remember you saying that you don't think that people would ever condone these acts, but that sometimes you can understand them, uh, where they yeah. come from, when they're yeah. um, you know, beaten as children by their parents or authority figures. Um, you yeah. know, mom and dad are at work all day and they have grandma at home and grandma does not um, yeah have the same values and the child is raises, you know, raises, the whole issue of, raises the whole issue of moral responsibility and free will because if you have a very abusive childhood and you become an abuser to what extent do you have control over your actions and so on and that issue is an unresolved debate among moral philosophers and psychologists but our legal system does take it into account to some extent the degree of control that we have over our behavior I do agree. Okay, we do have a question in now. Um, it says, in light of all this knowledge about how cruelty can develop in people, do you see progress in helping prevent and or treat cruelty? Well, um, remember I said that there's a, in our evolution we have a balance between empathy and predatory cruel behavior. And it, um, you could say that these are archetypal potentials in the individual. And it looks like the kind of environment that you have in childhood will evoke one or the other. There's a balance between the two. Uh, so if there's anything we can do about it, it, it would be by having decent child rearing practices so that the, the empathy side of the equation uh, and the capacity for, for compassion and sympathy for others is stronger than the potential for predatory behavior. That's all I can think of, really. Right. What we can do about animal cruelty, I don't know. We have legislation, but uh, it doesn't seem to be very effective. Here in, uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, animal cruelty is a huge issue. Um, pets and dogs are very much loved in the society out here, and the second there's a hint of a puppy mill or some sort of animal cruelty ring going on, it's immediately yeah. snuffed out. Um, yeah. But I don't think that that is normal um, around the but we U.S. Still have, we, we still have factory farming, and we still uh, animals are still used for testing cosmetics and medications, and so on. So um, I, I'm glad to hear what you say, but that's still a social problem, I think. I agree. Um, and you said before about um, children who are, uh, you know, um, abused by their parents. Do you think that this factors in when um, I notice that some girls and guys seek out, or maybe not seek out, you know, they're not conscionable about it, um, or they're not thinking about it, but they seek out these terrible relationships with uh, bad individuals, and it's almost like they're seeking out individuals 
similar to those that tortured them as, or not tortured, but uh, abused them as children. Yes, that's very common, and it's, it's traditionally referred to as the repetition compulsion. And it's thought to be due to an unconscious need to repeat the situation in an attempt to master it. Um, you could say that the complex sort of um, the the, the um, abusive partner embodies the the complex, and there's an attempt to work it out. I see. Okay, looks like we do have another question now. Um, can you compare the degree of influence in early childhood experience to that in adolescence? Is childhood significantly more important in development of cruelty than adolescence? Um, that's a good question, but I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I, I would I would guess that um, the early the earlier experience is more important, but the brain is still forming during adolescence, so I wouldn't uh, discount the importance of adolescence. But of, I course, think the early, of course, early identifications are more important. I see. Do you think that that plays um, a large uh, part? Empathy is a develop. Em we are wired for empathy. We have an evolutionary capacity to be. We, we see empathy in children as young as two years old, and but there and there is a developmental line, um, but it can be thwarted or warped. So if you don't see empathy at home, and if people are not empathic to you, it may be a very difficult trait to acquire. I see. I see. Um, and we talked earlier about. Um, that Rwanda and Hitler, um, they were torturing and killing Jews and other folks of religion. Um, did you talk at all about um, violence towards women? Um, and is there any difference between cultures who are abusing women and cultures who are abusing, say, other religions? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. I, um, that really requires a social scientist to answer that question. I don't. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Sorry, that, that was a personal question hard of mine, and I know it's a hard enough to understand the intrapsychic problems without. When you get into society, you have a whole new emergence of a whole new level of complexity, which I, I'm not really familiar with. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, okay, uh, we have one person that would like you to comment on scapegoating and how that may. Um, factor into cruelty to others. Yeah, well, scapegoating is very important. Um, um, in in biblical times, the sins of the people were loaded onto a scapegoat that was then evacuated into the desert, carrying the sins of the people um, with it, and so on. And um, um, it's still a, a, a popular mechanism for for um, avoiding any sense of personal blame. Uh, it has to do with that mechanism of, of pathological splitting, denial, and projection that I mentioned. Um, uh, I don't know if I can say much more about it, um, really. Um, it's okay. We we do we've got uh, more questions now, so we can move on. Um, let me see. Can we differentiate among adverse childhood experiences in terms of which types of adverse experiences? are most likely to produce cruelty as children become adolescents and adults? I think predatory behavior from parents is the, is the worst thing, especially especially unpredictable predatory behavior. Uh, un unpredictable cruelty um, from predatory parents, that, that tends to produce psychopathic individuals. That really is the worst kind. I, I agree. Um, here we go. Are peace and war different archetypes in the collective and conscience, or do you think they are opposite ends along one gradient of an archetype? Can we speak of one without constellating the other in the unconscious? Well, the, I mean, the simple answer to that is, is the generic answer that all archetypes are bipolar. So that there is no such thing as one pole of an archetype without the other. I see. Um, I see. So you'd have to see them together. Yeah. The, I mean, the yeah. the problem is that saying that war is archetypal is not much of an explanation. It's really just giving it another name. I it's, see. Um, very uh, war is a very complex phenomenon, uh, the subject of a whole other 
Moving on. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are social reasons, historical reasons, economic reasons, as well as psychological reasons. Uh, it, it, it's not a purely intrapsychic phenomenon. Um, could you speak specifically to the psychopath sociopath issue? Um, can Dr. Corbett comment on cruelty and tolerance as something that is adopted by an individual from the collective? Myself, coming from another cultural culture where cruelty and violence is a lot more common and therefore was not shocking but part of reality. Living in the U.S. for a number of years, only now I realize that my own tolerance was much lower. So this is an individual who grew up in a culture where there was a great deal of cruelty, is that what he or she is saying? I believe that's what and she's so what saying, and then she moved to the U.S. and realized um, how big her tolerance was. Yeah, and so what was her question, or was that... Let's see. She wanted you to comment on um, if the tolerance is something that is adopted by an individual from the collective. Well, I think that the culture that you grow up in will radically affect what you can tolerate and what you think is normal. So I think she sort of answered her own question, really. I mean, she... I don't right. think there's much more to say about that. Um, Let's see. Um, will you elaborate a bit on cruelty in films, television, and popular culture? What is your view of the impact on the viewers of these mediums? Well, I think the, 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 the deep question is why we, why is it that we enjoy watching the suffering of other people in movies and on the media? The media and the movies are full of torture and cruelty and the suffering of other people. Um, uh, tragic media are very common. Movies like Titanic, there are lots of tragic movies. Um, so what is it that is so attractive and so interesting about that? Um, it seems to be the case that we we can um, vicariously participate in the, in the suffering of the other person knowing at the same time that we're safe and it's not really happening to us. So we can have the emotional arousal without, and at the same time that we know we're not in danger. Something like that. Uh, and it vicariously said, we can identify with the victim or we can, if you happen to be a sadist, you can identify with the sadistic, cruel person, um, or you can feel morally superior, um, or you can feel morally outraged all the while knowing that you're safe. Um, I see. And I, you know, I think that these movies and media wouldn't be so popular if they didn't correspond to our own human ability to be um, cruel and sadistic. Um, but somehow we need to experience tragedy in media. We need to be able to vicariously see it and know that we're safe at the same time. Maybe it's a form of mastery. I think you've got something going on there. That's how I felt watching Hotel Rwanda. Yeah, yeah. Um, here is, please speak to the sociop or psychopath sociopath challenge for others meeting and recognizing it. Um, I believe they want to know, you know, what do we do when we, maybe not just come across one as individuals, but what when what about when they are your sister, your friend, your roommate? Oh, that's a huge problem. I mean. The psychopaths are notoriously untreatable by psychotherapists, except by a few special specialists. But the average psychotherapist would have enormous trouble treating the psychopath, which is why there, there are specialists who do it. And what you do, um, I mean, you have to protect society. If they're violent, they have to be locked up. But unfortunately, in our culture, psychopaths do very well, as long as they're not criminal. If they're intelligent enough, um, and they're not violent, they can do very well in our culture. Many of our CEOs, um, um, military people, police, the, the, the MO of the psychopath is to have omnipotent control over other people. So they go into professions where they can have control over other people. So a lot of them will go into politics uh, or become uh, powerful in business 
uh, in those kind of situations, they can have control over lots of other people and not care about the results of their actions. And um, the dynamics are thought to be that they feel safe if they're in control. So that they need to control other people in order to feel safe because they had such traumatic childhoods. And what you can do about them, uh, I don't know, other than avoidance. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know. The violent ones have to be locked up for the protection of the rest of us. And of course, the, the psychopaths raise tremendous moral dilemmas. If, if we start to devalue them or dehumanize them, we become like them. So we have to find some way of protecting society from them while we are at the same time trying to understand them, but they're not really treatable. I think they have some kind of brain disease myself, but they also have very traumatic childhoods. I read a book titled uh, Snakes and Suits, and it was all about the psychopath climbing the ranks in business and why they are the perfect machine for the corporate world, not, not worrying about empathy for fellows that they work with or fellows from other businesses. Cut right. They just don't care. They, they don't care. And the same is true in politics, unfortunately. Yes. So there are a lot of political psychopaths, I'm afraid. Yes. And, and, and not, scary would be if they got into the military, if they became senior generals in the military, that would be very dangerous. Because then they would have terrible power. I agree. So and they're very, very manipulative. They know how to play the game, so to say. Um, let me see here. Um, there is a lot of focus on bullying in our schools in the U.S. right now. It is commonly thought that bullying has become more pervasive. Do you agree with this? Has bullying become worse? Um, why or why not? Well, I, I don't know if it's become worse or we're just getting better at recognizing it. It's very hard to say. I don't know. Um, it could be that we're just more conscious of it now than we used to be. Um, because they've always been bullying. I, I think kids who bully are kids who are being abused and they're identifying with the people who are abusing them. They're treating other kids. I want to get out of the sunlight, sorry. They're, they're treating other kids um, um, the way they're being treated at home, basically. I see. Uh. The tragedy with the psychopath seems to be that people think they can balance and change this reality with love. Um, do you have any comment on this? That, that is not possible, correct? Um, I'm afraid that's not possible. The, the, if you show love to a psychopath, they interpret that as weakness. The, the, the psychopath is the one person where empathy is the wrong thing to do. If, when a psychopath experiences empathy, he just sees that as weakness. So they need a, a kind of a tough kind of love. Um, but any overt love or empathy is, is the worst thing you can do. Uh, that's probably the only exception. In, in most other cases, empathy is very important and love is very important, of course. But for psychopaths, it's not helpful. Now, they're, envious, you... they're envious of love. Because they can't really feel love, they will often, in the past, some killers who were psychopaths have killed people because they were loving because they 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 the envy wants to destroy what the psychopath knows he can never have so it's not a dangerous thing. do you think that the psychopath um i've seen a couple movies documentaries do you think that a lot of them are brought up as psychopaths from um abusive parents like we talked about or are there a good amount of them that are just born um, with this brain disease and it doesn't matter what happens in their adolescence or childhood? It's hard to tell because we know that developmental influences in, in early infancy affect brain development. So it's, you know, I, whether they would have become, I guess the question, would they have become psychopaths in, in a normal family? I suspect not. But I don't know how you would prove that. I, I suspect if they have some neural deficit, it's the result of being abused that affects brain development. But I don't think anyone really knows that. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have another one. Um, how might we transform medical and psychological education to reduce cruelty, for example, in psychiatry and pediatrics? Well, um, 
you know, doctors will do things that they think are helpful, even if it seems cruel. So I'm not deliberately trying to be cruel. I mean, they're giving treatment PCP um, because they think it's helpful. They're not doing it usually because they're sadists. Um, and people carry out painful medical procedures because they think it's being helpful. I think it's going a bit far to call the doctors sadistic. The doctors um, might be unconsciously sadistic and maybe they're giving a treatment that really is valueless, but I think most doctors think they're trying to be helpful, even if they're doing something painful. Yes. Uh, so that's as much as I, I'm sure there are a few exceptions. But, uh, I was going to say it's very frightening to think that there's a dentist out there who's sadistic and you know might not hit you with enough Novocaine the first time. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, Von Franz speaks of the cruelty factors with surgeons, which may be or may not be transcended. Can you speak to this? Well, uh, she, I think she's probably talking about the fact that um, uh, aggression can be sublimated. The sublimation is a very mature defense in which the original, uh, speaking sort of psychoanalytically, in which the original drive is, is, is not seen or it's, it's contained in a completely socially acceptable form. So that the theory would be that a sadistic surgeon would sublimate his aggression by cutting in his surgery so that it looks like he's doing socially ex something socially acceptable even though it's actually got a sadistic motivation. So that's as much as I can say about that, that surgery could be highly sublimated aggression. But uh, how often that's the case, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully sure very rare. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it looks like our, our questions have run dry. Um, do you have any yeah. final thoughts for us tonight before we end the webinar for the no, evening? I, I think we could stop if you're happy with that. I think so. Uh, we can't thank you enough for joining us today, Dr. Corbett. Um, we hope to have more webinars with you. I think that we're coming up with ideas every time we meet. Um, but this this was a wonderful event, and I can't wait to get the video up for everybody. Thank you. Well, we'll talk to you yeah. soon. And everybody, uh, be on the lookout for our email with the video up. Um, and everybody, enjoy the rest of your night. Good night. Good night, Dr. Corbett.